that's a different thing from persistent high inflation, which we do not expect. And if we do get it, then we have the tools to deal with it. A lot of these young people do not understand the interplay of business, of government, and of how banking works. Ration books. Buy now for the new ration book for food, personal ration book, the clothing book. And don't forget your identity card. With the big banks in trouble, their rescue is coming down to the British taxpayer again. Once you get one element of the economy out of control, once you've got, the, once you've got a price wrong, it has a ripple effect. The young suffer because firstly they're taxed heavily and then secondly the money they're paid in loses its value. The lower interest rates go, the more likely you are to get that increase in inequality. And too much cheap money creates, um, creates booms and uh, creates bubbles and those bubbles tend to burst. But we have been in a sort of a Ponzi scheme because the system has become extremely dependent on continuous money creation by central banks and by commercial banks. There are a few very simple reforms that should be discussed and can be discussed and that aren't discussed now. If we don't reform this system in the next two, three, five years, we're going to be in quite a lot of trouble. Economic problems seem more insurmountable than ever. Wealth inequality, inflation, poverty, banking crisis, indebtedness. There have been warnings from the past that certainly relate to the problems we have now. But they have largely been ignored. We're now entering a world where millennials and Generation Z the people born from the early 1980s onwards are likely to be the first generation since before the Industrial Revolution to be poorer than their parents. Young people uh, can work hard, they can study hard, they can be thrifty, yet they now find that it's so difficult to get even on the first rung of things like the property ladder. Many people can barely afford the necessities and global debt levels are at the highest ever. Is this debt sustainable? Or is it a big bubble that will eventually burst? Some people in society have obviously been doing well economically, yet for many, it seems that there is never enough money to go around. People don't have a, a belief in the system anymore. People have lost um, uh, confidence in the broader institutions and the broader underpinnings of the system. How did we arrive at this situation and what can we do about it? In an attempt to answer these questions, this documentary will start by looking at an area of economics that has scarcely been discussed in recent years and which is not well understood even by economists. And that is the process of money creation. On November the 20th, 2014, a British politician organised a debate on money creation and society in the House of Commons. Mr Steve Baker. Mr Speaker, I beg to move that this House has considered the subject of money creation and society. The methods of money production in society today are profoundly corrupting in ways which would matter to everyone if they were clearly understood. Why was this significant? I led a debate on money creation and society in Parliament. I was really proud to secure it. But the truth is, hardly any politicians could participate in that debate. Why? Because they just don't know how the system works. This was the first time such a debate had been raised in 170 years. So Michael Meacher, a Labour MP, very much on the left. It is so little understood by the public 
uh, that money uh, is created uh, every time by the banks that they make loans. Michael Meacher and I were the only two in, in, in the Commons who seem to really understand that money is loaned into existence by banks. So, uh, yeah, the, the, the truth is a very wide range of people don't, don't understand the monetary system and a remarkable number of economists. The fact of the matter is that most people take money for granted. They can tell you how it ought to be spent, but ask them where it comes from. That's a very good question. Gold reserves. And the answers are not so clear. Um, I don't know, really. I'm not quite sure. I never thought about it. Good question. <laughs> well, it's under this fractional reserve banking, so it's deposits. It comes from other people. Well, they get it from the money invested by other people. They take parts of our money. The Bank of England. And give it to other people. To me, I give money to the bank to like, keep it safe, and then they lend it out to make money out of it. A very difficult question. It is a theoretical construct. <laughs> trees. <laughs> <laughs> Understanding how money is created is an essential first step to fixing our monetary system. For most people, monetary policy uh, and monetary economics is, is a black hole. They, they have no conception of it, they have no understanding of it. Indeed, it is very difficult. The more regulations, the more central banks get involved, uh, the more complexity is created in the financial markets, the more difficult it is for the common man to understand what is going on. I believe the economic education is lacking in the UK and US and globally, and most people have no idea how uh, money is made, even finance uh, managers, bankers, as well as you know, finance journalists as well. It's a, it's a crazy it's a crazy situation because there's just such a poor understanding of how money is made. In most economics courses in universities, including in most economics textbooks, it is taught that when banks make loans, they take money from depositors and lend it out to borrowers. The bank is thus simply considered an intermediary between savers and borrowers. Yet this is a false model of how banking really works. So as things stand today, just about every economics textbook used in both undergraduate and postgraduate courses teaches that when banks make loans, what they're doing is lending out money. They're lending out depositors money. Of course, this is in fact not the case. When a bank makes a loan, it creates that money out of thin air. William White was head of the monetary department at the Bank for International Settlements, which is the central bank of central banks. When I, when I heard that this is what the textbooks were saying, I was frankly surprised because that was not the way we at the central bank thought about the money creation process at all. When a bank lends you money, that money is created by the bank into existence. It sounds bizarre. But that's what happens. If I need to borrow, you know, £100,000 to get a mortgage on a house or something, I go to the uh, bank, I give them the deeds uh, for the house, and they create £100,000. It literally is out of thin air, and that money is lent into existence. When banks make loans, they create new money out of thin air. What happens is that if you go along to a bank and you, as a businessman, and you say, uh, will you lend me some money? Um, if the bank agrees, uh, then what happens is that uh, you sign a document that you have borrowed a million pounds. Now, that's fine. And as you walk out of the door, you will be told, oh, that million pounds is in your account now. Now, in terms of accounting, what's happened is they haven't actually got that million pounds to lend you. What they do is, across their books, they create another entry, which, is, which we would call a deposit, um, uh, to balance, if you like, uh, what they've agreed to lend you um, on, on the asset side of their balance sheet. So they've got to balance that with a liability on the other side of that balance sheet. So you have a million pounds here, and you have a million pounds there. Where's it come from? Most money that actually exists today in countries like Britain or America, most of it is actually lent into existence by those people who hold that magic card, um, a bank licence. 
don't think I don't think a lot of people were, were, were working in the banking system have any idea really where this money comes from. Money is created out of thin air when banks write a loan. It's just ethereal money increasing. Thinner. Banks creating money when they make loans is further confirmed by the Bank of England on their own website, citing publications from the Bank's Monetary Analysis Directorate. So what does this mean for you? When you go to the bank for a mortgage, the bank is not lending you someone else's money for which the other person receives interest with the bank taking some of it. When the bank lends you money, it conjures the money out of thin air on the spot, which you then pay interest on. Here's the rub though. If you get into financial difficulties and cannot pay your mortgage, then the bank gets to seize your very real asset, which you have worked hard for. So the process is, the bank creates money out of thin air, lends it to you, you work hard all day to pay the interest to the bank as well as pay back the principal, and then if you fail to pay them, they take your very real assets, which you certainly did not create out of thin air. We live in a society where people are encouraged uh, to get into debt uh, and, and to become almost the agents or, or, or or, or the employees for a time, but the agents of, of the financial services sector through debt. So there's a, there's a sense that, that there is something wrong even if most people can't put their finger on it. Before we learn more about the injustices generated by banks creating money out of thin air, we need to also consider the role within our monetary system, played by central banks such as the US Federal Reserve, the Bank of England and the European Central Bank. There is money creation done in two different ways by banks and crucially and rather differently actually at least in a quantitative way over the last 10 years or so by the central bank by printing money. Starting after the global financial crisis of 2008, central banks launched quantitative easing or QE, buying billions and billions of government bonds with newly created money. Money created simply by entering a few strokes onto a computer keyboard. And since 2008, they have repeated this exercise on numerous occasions. In total, by June 2022, $28 trillion of new money has been directly created through QE. In the UK, almost all the money that has been created since 2008 has been created by the Bank of England printing it. We have completely um, if you will, lost control of how we create money and how much money we're willing to put into the economy. If you look at all the economic and financial problems that we had in recent years, uh, you can clearly see that the problem or the problems are not related to a shortage of money. Quite the opposite. No one could possibly uh, argue today that there isn't enough money uh, circulating in the economy. On average since 1960, the global money supply has approximately doubled every decade. This extraordinary, relentless and long-running debasement of our currencies has not only served to reduce the real value of the money you have in your pocket or your bank account, but more importantly, as we are about to see. It has caused far-reaching economic distortions, inequality, inflation, and the largest asset bubble in human history. The 
The biggest beneficiaries of the massive increase in borrowings uh, are the asset holders, are those who work in the financial system, what can be described generally as Wall Street. Uh, and those that suffer are the main street, small companies and people who don't hold assets or people who have low income levels. 20 or 30 years ago, they can save enough for a down payment to buy a house. Uh, now the value of houses relative to income has risen so high that it's impossible for most of them. And we're back to the bank of mom and dad and all that stuff, which in itself increases the inequality of opportunity. And that's because lots of assets like property have been inflated by the system. And this is not only unjust, but it is unsustainable. So they're creating that money in particular into mortgages. That means the money goes first into housing. And there's something called a Cantillon effect, which says when you have an inflation, a creation of money, the things which people buy first, where there's the initial demand with the new money, those prices rise. The inequity that results from money printing is something that uh, nowadays we know as the Cantillon effect. And uh, this was Richard Cantillon, who, uh, before he became a banker in Paris, um, he became involved uh, in the supply chain for the British Army in the War of the Spanish Succession. And this was uh, in the very early 1700s. And he noticed the effect of um, uh, price differentials from uh, wealth differentials and how um, you know, people who had the money and spent it got the best prices in the market, as it were. The people who got the worst prices were the people who received it last. So you end up with this illusion of wealth, but it also means that those people who couldn't get to the get-go and find the money for the deposit are excluded from the housing market permanently. This is where you start to see this increasing inequality. With the free flow and free printing of money, um, uh, and the increase in debt, uh, there is uh, inequality, and quite frankly, it leads to injustice um, on, uh, concerning like who makes money out of this and who gains from this. Under the current system, house price bubbles transfer wealth, as we all know, from the uh, young to the old and from those who can't get on the property ladder uh, to existing house owners, which increases wealth inequality. Uh, if you receive this money last, you have already fi found that prices have risen. And if you don't receive it, like you're a pensioner or a worker on a, uh, on a low wage, then you suffer from monetary inflation. So if you're creating money and pumping it into housing, we shouldn't be surprised that young people are stuck with the injustice that not only are houses unaffordable for them today, that unaffordability seems to be getting worse for them because as they save the deposit, they just find the house that they were aiming to buy has just accelerated away from them. But it's not just housing where prices are distorted. Money creation is never neutral. It disproportionately benefits the first recipients of money. And among the first recipients of money, apart from government, are the large corporations that have massive access to capital markets. We have a situation where Wall Street, uh, Wall Street uh, amplifies and, and, and sends capital to the dominant players and it withdraws capital from anyone that's lower growth, exacerbating the consolidation in the industry and then driving CFOs and CEOs to make decisions that really aren't rational for the civilization. In the last 10 years, the biggest borrowers uh, have been uh, governments and uh, big corporates. Uh, they had the easiest access to financial markets and they have benefited from this uh, gigantic wave of money printing. So the total debt of, of governments over the last 10 years has has doubled. But clearly the biggest beneficiaries are uh, the financial institutions, uh, investment banks, fund managers, rating agencies, brokers. 
they really benefit from this uh, gigantic issuance of debt uh, and that has led, led to a major increase in the revenues as a result of excessive money supply. Global public debt is currently $60 trillion. Total global debt is $280 trillion. Now we bandy these numbers about billions and trillions, but we forget just how big a trillion is. There are 12 zeros in a trillion. A trillion is a million millions. I could spend a million pounds every day since the year zero, and I still would not have spent a trillion pounds. And <laughs> the UK national debt is two trillion. As I say, global public debt is $60 trillion, and um, total global debt is $280 trillion. It is an astonishingly high number. How did we get to this situation? At Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, delegates from 44 allied and associate countries arrived for the opening of the United Nations Monetary and Financial Conference. From the Second World War right up until 1970, the major currencies of the world were linked to gold under the so-called Bretton Woods system. Inflation was generally very low throughout these decades, but excessive US government spending and easy monetary policies in the 1960s put pressure on the dollar. And in 1971, President Richard Nixon ended the backing of the dollar with gold. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets. Ever since 1971, our currencies have been unbacked. It's known as fiat money, meaning it is what we say it is. Nothing else is behind our paper currency. We had the bright idea of making the leaf our currency, causing everyone to become rich overnight. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. Inflation, bit of a problem. However, we just see it as transitory. Your dollar will be worth just as much tomorrow as it is today. Since 1971, the purchasing power of one paper dollar has fallen by close to 88%. Following the breaking of the link with gold, and especially after the 1973 Arab-Israeli war, the energy crisis became a monetary crisis. But since then, the situation's got worse. Escalating prices and an inflation in violence which matches the inflation of monetary values. Inflation surged in most developed countries, reaching as high as 25%, for example, in the UK in 1975. Too many families living in overcrowded conditions in dilapidated rooms. The solution to inflation was hard to find, but in the end, it was recognised that it had to be high interest rates. Mr. Chairman. In 1980, Paul Volcker, chairman of the US Federal Reserve, introduced the highest interest rates America had ever had, 20%. As the 1980s progressed, interest rates came down sharply, and it is from this period that the bubble we're experiencing today began growing. Debt started increasing at unprecedented rates and would continue doing so for the next generation. So what we've seen over the last generation or so is a series of ever larger debt bubbles created by central bank monetary policy. Uh, initially, the falling interest rates of the 1980s created a series of bubbles in housing and some other sectors. Then when those burst in 1990, the response from Alan Greenspan at uh, the Federal Reserve was interest rates of 3%, the lowest for generations, which then set in motion an even larger bubble, the dot-com bubble. Then when that burst in 2000, the response was even lower interest rates of 1%, which created a yet larger bubble, the housing bubble. Then of course, when that burst in 2008, the response was the lowest interest rates of all, more than a decade of 0% interest rates, which has now created the largest bubble in history. In fact, now approaching a $300 trillion global aggregate debt bubble. So looking back over my career in financial and commodity markets, the first real uh, event, if you like, was the stock market crash of 1987. Uh, during that time, everyone referred back to the crash of the 1930s. Uh, 
you know, the expectation was that it would be similar. It wasn't because the central banks, particularly led by Alan Greenspan at the Federal Reserve, intervened, uh, reduced interest rates, and righted the ship. Uh, of course, it's not really writing the ship. What it was doing was it was delaying the ability of the market to clear properly. Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan made a habit of cutting interest rates whenever there was a wobble in the stock market. It was a stance that stood aside from increasing asset prices, but was willing to come in and cut rates when asset prices fell. Well, if you work backwards, if you do the backwards induction, and, and um, assess the, you know, and, and look at the implications for current asset prices. Well, if they go up, central banks not going to interfere um, or intervene by raising rates. Uh, but if, if, if asset markets fall, they're gonna intervene by cutting rates. So it's, it provides an asymmetry that in turn influences current asset values and, and in sort of the obvious direction, it makes assets more attractive. Much of the money created by the banks in the late 1990s flowed into the US stock market, leading to the most overvalued market since 1929. Then, when the dot-com bubble burst, the Fed responded with even lower interest rates. These artificially low rates then stimulated the growth of the biggest real estate bubble in history, financed by debt, not only in the US, but also in Ireland, Spain, the UK, Iceland and many other countries, leading to the global financial crisis of 2008, when it became clear that all this debt was unsustainable. When this bubble burst in 2008, the response was even lower interest rates. Many governments also intervened further on a massive scale with state guarantees of bank borrowing and lending. Mr. Speaker, this means that participating banks can start having confidence in each other again because they will know that the government is standing firmly behind them when they all want to issue new debt. The government's actions to save the banking system are on trial and if it doesn't work, they don't have a plan B. Central banks around the world also began quantitative easing in effect, money printing, to boost their economies. And for most of the last decade, stubbornly kept fixed interest rates close to zero, or even at negative rates, in the case of the European Central Bank. When you go back through thousands of years of history, we have never, ever seen anything like this. It will be sensible to ask, how has all this artificial interest rate fixing and money printing improved our economic predicament? I think most people have an intuition that quantitative easing and the government uh, printing fiat currency is a rather dicey proposition. The policies that were followed prior to the great financial crisis and starting in 2008 were essentially replicated afterwards. So that we had more of the same policies prior to the crisis and we've had still more of the same policies since the great financial crisis and still more of still more of the same monetary policies, at least since the pandemic. So if we look at the 2008 crisis, for instance, a lot of the pain during that crisis was felt in the banking sector and then the insurance sector, for instance. Whereas now uh, there's so much malinvestment that I think the next crisis will be far broader. For instance, in pension funds, where people's life savings, uh, due to artificially low interest rates, has been uh, invested, quote unquote, in very high risk forms of debt and very high risk speculative assets. It's crazy. They keep, you keep doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. That's the definition of madness, isn't it? Because central banks have done the same thing again and again and again every time there is a crisis, we have a moral hazard situation. Uh, everybody knows that if the market has a big shakeout, the central banks will cut rates to zero. Now they'll add QE. And if all that fails, the governments will get out the fiscal spigot and spray as much money as they can on the system until it writes itself, all in order to preserve the status quo. Now, 
This may be least painful in the short term, but it's much more painful in the long term. Okay. The idea that central banks are going to avoid bubbles or financial crisis by tweaking the monetary policy mechanism is farcical because the policy itself is aimed at creating a bubble in sovereign bonds. By making sovereign bonds extremely expensive, they incentivize what is called the bubble of everything. In addition to the quantity of debt going up and up and up and the debt ratios going up and up and up, the quality of that debt has been going down and down and down. And so there's a much larger proportion of it that is sort of um, uh, junk. Uh, the much larger proportion of the, the, the bonds that are um, triple B just on the edge of being junk. Uh, clearly, the central banks uh, were bailing out um, what are called zombie companies, companies that couldn't uh, pay back their debts uh, by lowering interest rates. They were making it somehow possible for these companies to raise capital. If you remove risk, you create zombies, companies that shouldn't exist uh, because their business model is broken, continue to exist. They drain capital, they drain energy, when what should happen is these companies should go bust and something else would come along and replace them that is more efficient. Before we consider what reforms to today's monetary system will better serve our economic future, we should revisit Vienna during the period between the late 19th and the early 20th century. Friedrich von Hayek won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1974 for showing how monopolistic money creation and centralised fixing of interest rates creates unsustainable asset bubbles, which are bound to burst. Hayek was able to predict the 1929 stock market collapse by looking at all the money created in the 1920s. He taught at the London School of Economics and is widely recognised as one of the fathers of what is now called the Austrian School of Economics. To understand Hayek's theory of asset bubbles, we first need to think about the role that prices play in an economy. We should think of money in some ways, not in all ways, but in some ways, as a product like any other. Uh, and if you have uh, a centrally planned way of setting, I don't know, the price of sugar or the price of grain or the price of bread, you might, by some miracle, get it right. Uh, you might, if you're intelligent, get it slightly close to being right, but if you're mispricing it, the entire economy will either buy too much sugar or not enough, too much bread or not enough, too much grain or not enough, and exactly the same happens when you price money. Prices are critical to a market economy. Prices allocate resources. So when a government sets the price of food or fuel or consumer goods, it distorts the economy. And the effect is the same when central banks set interest rates. Hayek showed that interest rates should indeed be thought of as the price of money. If people are borrowing too much money for the actual amount of savings available, then, in a free market, interest rates will go up, which will incentivize more savings while also reducing borrowing by making it more expensive. But we live in an economy where, rather than interest rates being set by the market, like the price of food or consumer goods, we have central banks acting as central planning committees fixing interest rates and setting them chronically too low, with the result that the demand to borrow, for example to buy housing, most of the time, is much higher than it should be. So when the governments of developing countries, such as Venezuela for instance, set the price of food artificially low, we're not surprised when they end up with food shortages. So similarly, when central banks in developed countries set interest rates artificially low at 0% for years on end, we should not be surprised that what we now have is a $300 trillion global debt bubble. The current system that we have is monetary socialism. 
does it really seem reasonable to believe that such human unpredictability of thought could or should be controlled by a select group of planners? Central planners attempting to steer our economy. An economy is a complex adaptive system that naturally strives for its own efficiency, and meddling with it creates price distortions that have negative consequences in most of our lives. The 19th century French economist Frédéric Bastiat wrote an essay called The Seen and the Unseen, and he discussed how the effects of economic policy can often have effects on the surface which seem positive, but actually what's going on under the surface is unhealthy for the economy. And a classic example would be central banks setting interest rates artificially low. So yes, you may end up with a decrease in unemployment and an increase in GDP. But this has very significant costs, including all of the distortions to the economy and also the increase in debt bubbles in the economy, which will eventually unravel. My own view is that having an extended period of very low interest rates and policies that involve quantitative easing do actually contribute and promote uh, debt bubbles. I think there is cognizance of central banks that uh, setting low interest, uh, interest rates uh, is distortionary. The fact that you have very low interest rates, which is a price, remember, has the effect of causing a, a maldistribution or a poor distribution of resources in the economy. We've had this very easy monetary policy for such a long time now that the economy has become unbalanced. So the out, you know, enormous growth uh, of the financial markets has sucked in um, many, many people who are now working in financial markets who shouldn't be working there. They should be working in engineering. They should be working in manufacturing, uh, uh, doing something really productive instead of uh, working at hedge funds, speculating in the financial markets. Um, it's, you know, it has to change. Uh, it's not good for the economy, our, our, our overall economic growth rate. Our economy can be so much more productive if money was priced properly. Debt bubbles are one of the problems created by low interest rates. I think the other problems created by it are far more substantial than debt double bubbles, and that is the misallocation of capital. Uh, what happens with low interest rates is you, you lose the most important signal in the economy in terms of where capital should be allocated. And what is the true uh, relationship between the supply of funds, savings, and the demand for funds, which is uh, demand for loans. And as a consequence, capital gets allocated to uh, non-productive uses. Capital gets allocated to companies and to uh, uses that actually uh, have uh, negative long-term returns, that in that sense, capital is being destroyed. The main problem with zero interest rates and uh, money printing, quantitative easing, as they call it, um, it doesn't work. They believe that printing money supports economic growth. There's no evidence for that in, in economic history. There's no correlation whatsoever over long periods of time between money growth and economic growth. Um, what it does produce in the long term is inflation. There's a very, very high correlation, very high correlation in the long term between money printing, uh, between money growth and inflation. So you get this enormous accelerating rush to destruction. And Hayek told us all about it in his Nobel Prize lecture. If you build jobs on an accelerating increase in the money supply, those jobs are only viable all the time the money supply keeps accelerating, all the time it's increasing. So of course you get a boom and a bust. Where is the justice in getting people into professions and jobs which are only sustained by this enormous accelerating increase in the money supply? In my 
in my uh, monthly writings for the for the Irish institution across continent, continental Europe, I've analysed every single policy response of the European Central Bank and financial authorities in the course of the last 10, 11 years. Um, and really, I think the authorities know themselves they've reached the end of the road. All policies now resolve to money printing. Uh, I think the, the prevalence of money printing has now made the situation basically unfixable. We have a situation where, where the ECB and the, and the Euro financial authorities completely control the banking system. Financial markets have been replaced by the printing press. And in fact, the ECB is operating in a manner more or less akin to the Soviet era monobank. So now the problem we've got is an enormous super bubble of debt for welfare states with debt projections that are all just runaway, soar away debt projections as an ageing population puts ever more demands on one another actually to pay for their social care, their health care and so forth. And the really big question we all now face is, is this ball going to be kept in the air, living beyond our means chronically? and ultimately funding it indirectly through money creation by central banks, in which case we'll be looking at a real calamity, and it will be a calamity highly likely to afflict all of the developed welfare states at once. And the truth is the financial system is now so complicated and so interdependent, we could get really profound chaos, uncontrollable chaos. What are the public going to do if it happens? The bursting of this bubble is now inevitable and the consequences for most of the population will be profound. The process is gradual. It's like the water keeps coming up against the dam. The dam holds, the dam holds, and then suddenly it all becomes untenable. When the bubble bursts, the natural response from central banks will be to do what they have always done. Cut interest rates and print more money. That is, they will attempt to reinflate the bubble. But why take the same action yet again? It's only going to increase the economic pain and social suffering in the end. The answer is, that central banks are trying to meet the objective set for them by their governments. High growth and low inflation. There appears to be little recognition that the prevailing economic theories are flawed. That the fixing of interest rates and the printing of money, in the end, actually produces the opposite, low growth and high inflation. The dominant thought among uh, this generation of central bankers is that if the demand for um, goods and services, aggregate demand, is too weak, then monetary policy must be too tight. And so then they have to ease interest rates in order to uh, create conditions in which demand will be increased and equal the supply of goods and services. Um, and so I think they really believe that. Now, they've come to explain this to themselves, that this might create financial instability, but they think that's not the fault of monetary policy. They think that's someone else's job, the bank supervisors, or they, they've decided to call it financial instability. And so they, they've compartmentalized it and separated it in, the, in their thinking. And I think that's, that's ridiculous. And consumer price inflation is one form of instability in the monetary system and asset booms and busts are another. And monetary policy owns them both. So what is the end game of this? I would say as an Austrian economist, I believe in the power of creative solutions and in innovation. 
I don't think that those dooms preachers uh, that we will go go down and and uh, everything will end up in a huge uh, in a huge bust uh, will work out. I think that we should slowly go back and look at what markets can do. They what solutions they can provide. The system is probably beyond being improved as it stands. Right now, inflation targeting with a system of regulatory committees, the Financial Policy Committee, the Prudential Regulation Committee, the Monetary Policy Committee, as Mark Carney explained, the the idea of these interlocking committees is to try and deal with the side effects of expansionary expansionary monetary policy. I mean, he really... He acknowledged the Austrian school critique, but wasn't willing to live with the, as he put it, liquidate, liquidate, liquidate thesis that maybe follows. You know, you're going to have a problem. The best thing to do is get through it as quickly as possible. That's not what the system's set up to do. The system's set up to be expansionary, but to give wise people sitting on committees the opportunity to try and pull levers. But this is monetary socialism. I mean, it really is. If it was about price fixing for food or fuel, or clothes, we would understand why there was chaos. But because we've got such high regulation and interventionism and price planning in the financial system, nobody really understands it and they haven't spotted that it's socialism. So what I would say is that I I wouldn't trust the management of the monetary system to any committee. It's got to be returned to the free market. Interest rates should definitely be set by the market. and. uh, the trouble with central banks setting it is that they, they work in a political context and therefore the decisions they make are going to be uh, uh, political to some extent. Hayek, I think, was uh, quite right that we've, we've actually got to, to get government out of the money. So the first key element of a reform monetary system must include market pricing of interest rates. Authorities... Uh, central banks uh, and governments will strongly resist the idea of having interest rates defined by uh, free market mechanisms. At the Cobden Centre, we've given a number of seminars on the monetary system, including in the European Parliament, at the Bank of England, and at the OECD, among other institutions. And it's always quite striking that this idea that interest rates should be set by the market is really not taught in any economics courses. Uh, All that's taught is the central planning of interest rates by central banks. Uh, It probably needs a crisis or a long period of high level of inflation for that idea to gain some traction. But there is clearly the need for public debate uh, about that. And that's the problem is currently you have no debate in the academic circle, in the political circles about the idea of reforming the system. The the problem is largely ignored. A second key element of a reform system must be to have honest money, preferably a currency backed by something real, such as gold, as it was for centuries before 1971. Certainly money that cannot be debased such that it has been, and that means the removal of the central bank's power to print unlimited quantities of new money. We value money because it's a a medium of exchange, that we can buy stuff with it. And uh, like any other good, uh, its value depends upon supply and demand. And increasing the supply of money means that its value is going to fall. It's like everything else. The more there is of it, the, the less people value it. Um, so unless there's some you know, major changes in how people actually value money, um, then you know, leave the supply of it pretty much alone. So I think once you focus on that, then you've got the recipe to, to having um, a currency that actually works. In the UK, at least, um we can definitely start to move in the right direction. The government could rewrite the Bank of England Act. What the government could do is tell the Bank of England that it should protect the purchasing power of the pound from one generation to the next. If they simply did that, the Bank of England's policy would have to change. No one could possibly argue 
that printing 400 billion pounds of new money, which is what they did last year, is protecting the purchasing power of the pound. Um, it, it's an immediate debasement of the currency. So they'd have to change that policy. They have to come up with a new way of protecting the pound's value. Uh, the important thing is to place some type of external limit on the capacity of the monetary authority to just expand the money supply and therefore indirectly by influencing the supply of what is loanable, manipulating interest rates. Historically, many people have held the view that something such as gold would provide a stable backing for our currency. And today's digital technology would allow us easily to return to a gold-backed currency, should we decide to. Now, the great thing about the situation we face today is we've realised the dream of that great economist Friedrich Hayek, who wrote about the denationalisation of money. Today, incredibly, entrepreneurs using financial technology are re-monetising gold, for those of us who believe in gold as money, and they're also delivering cryptocurrencies. Now, at the moment, cryptocurrencies are a speculative asset, but they are capable of being money. So people are likely to have, in the event of a crisis, freedom of choice in currency, provided governments don't do anything stupid. That's, I think, one of the biggest dangers, not trying to get the government to reform money. I think that's practically impossible. We need to make sure that governments don't interfere with entrepreneurs providing high quality money through free markets. There are many people who see cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin as the ultimate form of honest money. Over the last few years, what cryptocurrency has become most famous for is its series of speculative manias. It's important to remember that underlying this are a series of very important developments in computer science and game theory. I think that um, lots of monetary energy is stampeding out of the currency. It's seeking a store of value. Um, and uh, the store of value is, uh, its first stop was real estate and, um, and equity and bonds. And uh, now it's moving beyond that and it's starting to, to flow into Bitcoin. It's going to uh, create a counterbalance on all of the, the money printing. It's going to create discipline. I think cryptocurrency is a response to the frustration many people have with the current system. It is a response to the fact that we have a system in which uh, governments and through the banking system are arbitrarily creating money and allocating it in distortive kind of ways. People want privacy. People want to have some kind of anchor, some kind of objective form of money. The response from governments working alongside central banks has been to develop their own crypto money, known as Central Bank Digital Currency, or CBDC. Today, I'm proud to say that under the UK's presidency, the group of the world's seven most advanced economies, the G7, is launching a set of public policy principles for retail central bank digital currencies, CBDCs. Central, central banks are now beginning to pursue or become interested in CBDCs, which are central bank digital currencies. And partly the hand is being forced by the creation of these market-based uh, digital currencies like Bitcoin. And so now they have these competing alternative digital systems and they think, well, we need to create something similar, otherwise we will be outcompeted. Today, well in excess of 100 countries are exploring their own central bank digital currency. I think that this is actually a recipe for disaster. I think the development of CBDCs is deeply troubling. They might, for instance, program the currency so that it reduces in value over time in order to encourage us to spend it. If monetary systems are fully digitized and controlled by central banks uh, where there is no cash anymore, then they can run any kind of interest rate they want. They can run an interest rate of negative 10 or 20 percent. Ominously, it would be possible to program the digital currency to prevent it being spent, for example, on airfares or sugary foods or alcohol or to not be usable beyond a certain date. All governments have too much conflict of interest to make this work. More or less akin to the Soviet era monobank. Central bank digital currencies are not the answer and should not be part of any reform 
uh, of the system uh, because uh, they don't have any anchor. They are just another currency, another fiat currency, and they don't lead to any uh, limitations to the level of money supply that can be created by policy makers. If anything, they just create another engine of money creation for central banks. So that should really be avoided. We have to convince people uh, that uh, inflation exists for one reason alone, which is that there is too much money in the system. Governments keep growing, which means that governments are constantly looking for more money. Now, one way that they can get more money is to raise it through taxation. But they've reached, or are very close to, saturation point. There is a point at which people just will not put up with any more tax. And so how else can they get the revenue that they want? Well, the easiest way is through inflation. Inflation is a kind of sneaky tax, because what it does is to devalue the government's debt at the expense of savers. It's a way of transferring money from the private saver to the state. But unlike income tax, voters don't necessarily blame the government for the inflation. It can be much more plausibly presented as some kind of natural force, like a bad weather event. And therefore, politicians are always going to prefer the money printing to the direct taxation. So the way to improve the system is to reduce government involvement in the system, it's to reduce government involvement in, in, in the world of finance. And this is not going to be simple, this is not going to be fast, but what we need to do is to start getting government out of the business of banking, out of the business of finance, start slowly liberating the financial sector. So what's going to happen now? The super bubble has been building for an entire generation. With each recession around the world responded to by banks creating an even larger debt bubble. If we want to move to a more just system which doesn't promote increasing inequality, where people working hard are the ones who earn money fairly and can own their own home, then we need to move away from the system where the main people who benefit are those with access to artificially cheap money, created out of thin air by banks and central banks. It's incredibly difficult to move away from the current model because so many people have an interest in keeping it going. The existing monetary system is not sustainable and sooner or later, most likely after a new debt crisis, a new system will inevitably be needed. The sooner the reforms start, the better. It's always the line of least resistance for a politician to keep the party going rather than face the consequences. In other words, to inflate the bubble and hope that it blows up on some successor administration rather than have to take unpopular decisions himself. One way or another, when this, this super bubble of debt goes wrong and obligations goes wrong, we're going to need an educated public who elect the right politicians who are willing to be honest about the troubles that we face and how we're going to get through them. When enough people are, are no longer benefiting, when they're being disenfranchised from this system, um, then that will have, I think, uh, consequences in the political sphere. So unfortunately, until we have uh, more market influence and not uh, a system in which the central, uh, the central, whether it's the central bank or, or the central government that's dictating the terms of the way that the, that, the, that the monetary and the financial system is going to work, we're not going to have real reform. And we're certainly not going to get uh, any any. Um, we're not going to get out of this of this uh, downward spiral that we've created. So I think it is down to education and understanding what is actually going on. What they're doing is totally counterproductive. By destroying wealth in an economy, there is no way the economic outlook is being improved. It is deteriorating as a result of the monetary policies 
being implemented by the establishment. So what we see over the last few hundred years is that monetary systems tend to shift and change every few decades. And we are now definitely due for a change in the monetary system. Uh, and it will be very welcome. King John, the f King John to thank for that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. who, who gave the rights to the banks to, to do that. <laughs> 